uh, we're very privileged today to have with us Tor Thorsten Benner, who's the director of the Global Public Policy Institute in Berlin. And his topic is how Germany struggles to navigate the new geopolitical competition. So we'll have that done in 20 minutes, I've no doubt. Uh, he's co-founder and director of the Global Public Policy Institute, co-author of Author Authoritarian Advance, Responding to China's Growing Political Influence in Europe. He teaches at the Hertie School of Governance and is a board member of More in Common, an international initiative to strengthen democratic societies by countering social division and polarisation. He studied political science, history and sociology at Segan, York and the University of California at Berkeley and is an MPA from Harvard. So normal rules apply. Firstly, if you wouldn't mind taking, turning off your phones, uh, secondly, Thorsten will talk for 15, maybe 20 minutes on the record, and then we move to question and answer, which will be off the record. So, we look forward, we look forward to you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and also to the invite to your institute and to Dublin, and thank you also, Max, for organizing this. It's a great pleasure to be here. I met an old friend in Frankfurt uh, last night and said, like, uh, I'll Move, uh, I'll go to Dublin and give a talk about German foreign policy strategy and he said, ah, interesting, is there a strategy? <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't know that uh, we had one and uh, he then went out and I said like, hmm, what do you mean? And then he said like, look, in the old days, uh, what, what he remembered from history was that Germany had clear strategies uh, in the 50s, uh, what we call Westbindung, integration into the into the West, uh, then Ostpolitik uh, in the in the 70s, and then fostering uh, fostering European unity and making our contribution to that. Uh, to which I replied, but those were also, in a sense, easier times uh, because Westbindung actually meant or presupposed that you had a West you can integrate uh, with uh, Ostpolitik presumed a bipolar system where you could kind of uh, you know, make a, a slight uh, important adjustment, uh, but the kind of uh, parameters were clear. And right now Germany, and that's why I say out of order, is facing an environment where these old parameters that, that we thought were clear are no longer givens, and uh, I think we're not the only country that, that struggles to navigate this new geopolitical competition, but uh, maybe we're the country that's challenged hardest. Uh, and that's my first point. Uh, and Thomas Baga explained this uh, really well in a recent uh, Washington Quarterly essay uh, called The World According to Germany, where he argued uh, that uh, of all the countries uh, after 1989, Germany kind of thought this was the kind of universal message for how the rest of uh, world history would unfold. That it would unfold in the exact same way uh, where the Cold War ended uh, and where liberal democracy and multilateralism were victorious and that things would move in this direction and that uh, we kind of invested in this and banked on, on this. So Germany Germany's foreign policy philosophy was very much multilateral. It's almost a fetish. It's the thing that we push for. There's nothing. There's nothing else in the in the kind of imaginary that uh, could easily supplant this. So we're much much more challenged than other countries uh, like uh, France, for example, where you had a strong, you still have a strong Gaullist uh, tradition in in foreign policy thinking. By the, by the events, uh, this return of the geopolitical competition, uh, Crimea and uh, Russia's advances in Europe, uh, China's rapid ascent uh, and the end of the illusion that China by integrating and being successful economically would become more like, uh, more like uh, us. So, uh, and uh, of course the election of uh, Donald Trump uh, and no longer being NATO is turning 70 now, but I think doubts have never been stronger in terms of uh, how long it uh, will last uh, and uh, whether we can still rely on the kind of best uh, uh, of all worlds that we ever lived in, uh, the, the unconditional security guarantee 
by the US, uh, then the offer to compete economically with, uh, with uh, the US, uh, that all that, that NATO's, NATO offers. So there's a, this came as quite a shock to, to uh, the German dominant uh, mindset after 1989. And it's no, no wonder that uh, we're struggling to adapt to this. And what I tried to trace, in uh, just give you a few, few indications in terms of what are the ideas that are being kind of uh, floated uh, by German policymakers in terms of how we should be and could be adapting, uh, ad adapting to this. I agree with my, my friend that uh, we haven't adapted uh, well or like well enough and, and, and fast enough. So there are big question marks on what uh, the German strategy actually is, but it's also a pretty tricky challenge. And also the baseline, our German foreign minister Heiko Maas, he always talked about uh, the, the kind of discursive vegetative state uh, that we're in in terms of our, uh, the discursive coma vigil, he called it, uh, that we're in in our terms of our foreign policy discussion. And uh, we're only slowly coming out of this. The first answer five years ago by German leading German politicians, our president, the then foreign minister Steinmeier and our defense minister was to talk about more, ger more German responsibility. But talking about more German responsibility is almost is, is nothing more than a cop-out because what does it mean? Uh, it, it, it only becomes, is, is, a very, is a wonderful agent to paper over all sorts of difficult questions about trade-offs between interests, uh, security interests, economic interests, uh, interest in, in human rights uh, that we have and trade-off decisions to be made. If you just say more responsibility, it sounds nice until you actually, un until you actually uh, spell it out. So more recently there have been some attempts uh, by, by German uh, politicians to say how can we react to these end of some, the, the kind of geopolitical competition in which we find ourselves with uh, primarily with China and, and Russia and the US, the big question marks on in terms of the the role of uh, the role of the U.S. and uh, how, how Germany and Europe should position themselves. Uh, one idea that, uh, or like one important rethink, and I think there Germany really has has made quite an advance, and we talked about it briefly over over lunch, is on the economic front uh, that. Uh, in the German discussion, it has become an important element to speak of a Systemwettbewerb with Chinese state uh, capitalism, uh, a competition of systems in we, which we find ourselves in and that we need to be reacting, uh, reacting to. That's primarily an economic uh, wake-up call uh, from the German side because uh, Germans read very closely the uh, Made in China 2025 strategy that the Chinese party state put out and did the math in terms of if China succeeded uh, reaching its goal in terms of Made in China 2025, which would be the countries and industries that would be affected most uh, globally. And uh, in, on this heat map, it clearly showed that the traditional German industrial strengths would be Hard, hardest hit by a success of uh, China's made in uh, made in China 2025 strategy. So there's there's quite a bit of rethink that uh, from this perfectly complementary economic relationship that we had with China, we send high value added goods there, and uh, we get some cheap uh, cheap manufacturing back. Uh, that this complementary relationship is over, and uh, we find ourselves in a fairly tough and fierce competition where there's no level playing field uh, because China hasn't developed into a social market economy but state capitalism that uh, plays with plays by different rules and uh, uses different instruments and that we need to be reacting to this. So on, on this side, uh, Germany has really rethought quite dramatically in terms of uh, what at least is conceivable in, in terms of policy reactions uh, that uh, right now uh, we've become a lot more French in our approach to industrial policy. The, our, our economics ministry 
put out a strategy on German industrial policy 2030 where we, we talk about national champions, about active in industrial policy measures, about investment protection and screening of, of course that we've kind of tightened uh, over, the, over the past years. And we're also rethinking competition policy uh, to kind of take into account uh, uh, what the re that the relevant market may not just be Europe but globally and uh, that it may, be, you know, some argue it's very contested, uh, that it uh, may take European champions to compete effectively on, on that and that European competition policy needs to take, uh, needs to take this uh, into account. So vis-a-vis -vis on, the, on the economic front, vis-a-vis uh, -vis kind of system wettbewerb uh, with China, I do think uh, we have seen quite a shift in the in the German discussion, and that's only a start. Of course, it remains to be seen how it, this gets uh, gets uh, operationalized. the The other front is, of course, how we uh, how we would deal with uh, with competition on the on the security front, uh, and uh, how we structure our relationship uh, with with the U.S. and our contribution. To NATO, and I think there the picture is much, much less uh, favorable in, in terms of having having found uh, answers. Uh, I think there is uh, Chancellor Merkel hasn't presented uh, a coherent approach to how we should uh, face the United States, but our foreign minister has last last summer. It was quite an interesting document he put out on German America politic, how we should deal with uh, with the United uh, with the United States. And uh, he said that uh, we should come to a more balanced relationship where we also pull our weight more, that we have to invest more in, uh, into our military and uh, our military capabilities, uh, that uh, at the same time we have to act as a counterweight to the US where the US directly goes against uh, German and, uh, and uh, European interests and that we have to step into the void that the US has left by no longer investing in multilateralism, that we need to kind of uh, invest there and uh, take some stopgap measures to kind of uh, halt the decline of the, of the multilateral order. Now all these things, at, at, in, in, and especially uh, if, if they're combined with this approach of European strategic autonomy as a, as a goal that motivates this, all these approaches, all the, these concepts make a lot of sense to me. And I don't share the skepticism of a lot in the German, of a lot of voices in the German discussions, traditional transatlanticists who say that any talk about European strategic autonomy would jeopardize our relationship with NATO and our anchoring in the, in the transatlantic reliance. I do think uh, that it actually has a dual use function to talk about uh, about the strategic autonomy. On the one hand, you can say this is what we actually need in order to make a meaningful contribution to NATO uh, to have to be, have NATO become more balanced because this is also what the U.S. expects that we build our own capabilities and uh, if interests are aligned and if the US decides they will kind of want to continue with NATO we can happily contribute these assets and capabilities into the transatlantic uh, alliance no problem and i think will also be taken uh, more seriously by the US in the in the medium term if we have these capabilities as 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 germans and that this is also what the US side e uh, expects but it's also uh, a, hedge, a hedging strategy for the day th that the U.S. decides uh, maybe it's over with this unconditional security guarantee and uh, we need to have an answer on the European front uh, for this and, and the German front. And strategic autonomy could, it can be an important kind of focal concept uh, for preparing this while you know, making a more kind of balanced contribution to the, to the transatlantic alliance. So that, on paper, these these things all make sense. What our foreign minister has has said that uh, we we need to have a, a stronger security contribution on the on the German side, that we need to kind of uh, 
counterbalance the US where it acts ag against uh, European and, and German interests and uh, that we need to step into the void where US no longer invests in, in multilateralism. In practice, it's a lot more difficult. Being this counterweight has kind of worked in some instances, uh, uh, but it's tough, of course. Uh, in, on the Iran deal, I think your, Europe uh, has showed remarkable unity, and uh, even, even if this uh, special purpose vehicle that Europeans created hasn't made much of a difference, the very, the very uh, fact that we talk about creating an independent uh, payment uh, system and, and channels uh, to safeguard our interests against secondary sanctions effects by the US so it was symbolically very important. So in, in terms of counterweight, at least there, there Germany and uh, Europe kind of demonstrated uh, that uh, they, they can be serious about it uh, if they, they see their, their very interests threatened and the same goes for, for trade of course uh, where, where Europeans were quite, have been quite united uh, against the kind of protectionist threats on the, on the part of uh, the US president. In terms of our security contribution, of course, uh, Heiko Maas is a social democratic uh, foreign minister and I think he has said all the right things, but getting a majority in his own party and the German public uh, for a stronger security contribution is, is a different story and that's not just the problem of, uh, of the social, social democrats. Uh, we've promised we would kind of pay up to 2% of our GDP. Uh, we're not getting closer to that anytime, uh, anytime soon and uh, it's very, politically it's, it's very tough to mobilize majorities uh, for this right now in, in the German discussion and German credibility I think uh, suffers greatly. We cannot, on the one hand, talk about our contribution to European strategic autonomy and uh, a more balanced contribution to NATO without, without actually making these investments. And uh, of course, only some of these investments have to be purely military, but we need to have a strong and functioning mil military uh, to be credible in this and then all the investments in more diplomacy and civilian capabilities to go with that of course uh, are critically uh, critically important but we cannot say we invest in our kind of civilian crisis prevention capabilities and not invest in our in our mil military uh, ca capabilities third aspect and i want to end with this the kind of investing in multilateralism where the US is abandoning it or even going actively against it, I think is also a very important, uh, it's a very important uh, element of uh, the strategic rethink that Germany has and one that is closest in, in line with uh, where we're coming from and what makes up the German DNA of foreign policy th thinking. But this alliance of multilateralists that uh, Foreign Minister Maas has talked about and also the essence of uh, Chancellor Merkel's speech at the Munich Security Conference in February was we all together have to do this. We need to kind of uh, save multilateralism and do everything we can to make uh, multilateralism work. Uh, of course in, in practice this is uh, a, a lot harder if you face players that are not interested to do that. Middle power multilateralism can, uh, working with uh, the rest of the European Union who is willing, working with Canada, Japan, some other willing players can get you so far, but only uh, ultimately it will be, uh, will be quite tough. And uh, also the, the big question is whether we're actually willing to stand up for for also the, uh, the, the rights of these multilateral countries, uh, those committed to multilateralism, when one member of this alliance of multilateralists uh, is being attacked by another kind of bullying country. Uh, this is the, has been the case uh, with Canada multiple mm -hmm. times last year. Canada was kind of singled out by Saudi Arabia uh, uh, after the foreign minister dared criticize uh, some human rights practices 
in in the kingdom, and nobody stood uh, with Canada in after this. And also, two Canadian citizens are being held as hostages by the Chinese party uh, party state uh, right now. And there's some solidarity, but I think uh, this solidarity on on the part of those committed to multilateralism uh, could be could be a lot uh, could be a lot stronger. Plus. That's the open question in terms of whether this alliance of multilateralism has this kind of mutual support function, if it uh, if it is to work. Plus, the big uh, big question is uh, whether you can actually ultimately halt the decline of the multilateral order without the United States. Uh, with uh, I think uh, you can you can put some stopgap measures uh, in in place uh, as uh, as as long as the first uh, Trump administration lasts, but uh, I don't think we're any uh, remotely prepared for what a second Trump term and multilateralism uh, would mean and what our strategy would be, because this alliance is uh, a good kind of stopgap measure for one term, but uh, I'm not entirely sure we know what uh, what to do if uh, there were a second uh, Trump uh, Trump term. And uh, I'm curious uh, what you think uh, in terms of how Germany should be preparing for this, how Germany should be pulling its weight in Europe, uh, investing in uh, what our foreign minister calls Europe uh, united, uh, but uh, where many other European partners of Germany often accuse Germany with good reasons for hypocrisy and not investing enough in European unity on the eurozone and on other issues. I'm curious what you have to think about, uh, what what you have to say on this, and what your recommendations and ideas for how Germany can navigate this kind of treacherous uh, and difficult uh, new environment would be. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed.